I'd like to welcome John Cox. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me here to Cannon Falls to talk about World War One, And I'd like to hear some of those stories after. Because um, we, don't, we don't get a lot of information about you know, World War One. There's not too many people know about it or are interested. And sadly, America wasn't that interested in the Doughboys after it was over. I just read um, an article in a newspaper by a professor who wrote, why don't we know their stories? And he, he said, you know, people didn't want to hear about the Doughboys. They didn't want to hear about them being gassed or hit with flamethrowers because it was such a horrific war, the uh, injuries that guys suffered. And of course, you know, it really didn't solve any problems because uh, uh, less than, you know, two decades later, we, we go into World War II. So I put up this poster because it's this <coughs> World War I poster for America, I Want You with Uncle Sam. This was made by Montgomery Flagg, was the guy who designed it. And he designed it for a fellow named uh, a George Creel who was, um, worked for President Tommy Wilson, otherwise known as Woodrow. Do you know that Woodrow Wilson's real name was Thomas? I, I call him Tommy. Is any, <laughs> anybody here a fan of Woodrow Wilson? That's good, because neither am I. I don't, I, don't, I don't like Woodrow Wilson too much. I just say that openly. Uh, you know, um, um, like I said, we really have two hours worth of slides, so I have to go quick, but I, I'm, I'm, I digress. I want to talk more about this. You know, I, 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 I'm fascinated by my own country's history. And um, today we see people protest and talking about, you know, how their rights are violated or whatever. And I, I just kind of laugh because if you read about America in World War I, Woodrow Wilson or Tommy just wiped out all civil liberties. Okay, the George Creel, who had this poster made, was head of this committee, uh, the Committee on Public Information called CPI Committee. And that got involved kind of like from the Espionage Act. Um, and Woodrow Wilson had Americans arrested who were against his war effort. And in fact, the Espionage Act wasn't enough. He, he made the Seditious Act, the Sedi Seditious. Seditious Act of 1918, um, and he, anybody who spoke out against the war got arrested. I mean, you think th things are like people protest like now, right? Uh, Eugene Debs, he was the socialist candidate for president against Wilson in 1916. Debs got uh, arrested and convicted of, under the Sedacious Act, and he got 10 years in prison. Okay, that's 1918. So uh, we have a lot of freedoms today to say what we want about anything without any recourse of being arrested. But Woodrow Wilson was not. And even after the war was over, in 1919, he was still having people arrested who spoke out against his war policies. And we should think, before that, Woodrow Wilson was a confirmed pacifist. He said, I'm a pacifist. And in fact, his whole attitude was uh, he was going to be the, he kept America out of the war and he was going to negotiate the peace. And his motto was, was peace without victory, right? That the European, he was going to solve the European war with peace without victory. And, and I just kind of think about that because, you know, we had guys in the U.S. Army named like George Patton, Douglas MacArthur, and, you know, who's going to lead the Doughboys, Blackjack Pershing. I mean, those guys don't want to hear peace without victory. They wanted to go in and smash the enemy and win the war. Next slide. All right, you know, numbers, um, we're so much better today at administration and bureaucracy, maybe, and record keeping. And um, like I said, you know, most of my, my training and stuff was in the Civil War, but World War One's about the same with numbers. So when I say numbers, we're just going to be approximate. And this says, uh, you know, eight and a half million deaths. I just read uh, another book the other day, and the guy was trying to say there was 16 million. So we'll say there's eight and a half to 16 million deaths uh, caused by World War One. A lot of th these are counting military, you know, and we have a lot of civilian deaths, and um, and and um, 
if you read about the time period, right, we have the, the Spanish flu. Does everybody know about the Spanish flu? Which goes and kills more people than people killed in World War I. And estimates for the Spanish flu and deaths were 20 million to 100 million. So counting World War I and the Spanish flu, 5%, maybe, maybe even close to 10% of the world's population is dead from the war or the Spanish flu. Do you know, you know why they called it the Spanish flu? Because uh, we, we're talking about propaganda. Propaganda from all the countries involved in the war, in World War I, was so prolific. Um, so many men were dying from the flu, but the, the belligerents, the people fighting, the Germans, the French, the British, the Americans, they weren't putting it in the papers. They did not want you to know that people were dying by the flu, but Spain was neutral. And their news reporters just reported all about it. And so people thought the flu was coming from Spain. That's why it's called the Spanish flu. They don't know where it really originated, some say in Kansas. Um, does any, is anybody here fluent in French? Ah, oh, good. Or German? Good, because I, I try, you know, I, there's a lot of French words that I, a lot of people say I can't speak English well. <laughs> Never mind French, there's another guy. Uh, French or German. So, uh, um, at, at Tepples, at Tepples, France, E T A P L E S, was a, a, a medical hospital, and they think it might have started there. In fact, I met a Dutch doctor who his whole life is to study what happened there to find out about the flu because that strain of flu is still out there. And I mean, people would get the flu in the morning and be dead by that night. And it just wiped out whole cities in America and around the world. All right, next slide. Um, my talk's really about, it's supposed to be American World War I, and we're gonna talk about the whole thing. Uh, my wife, Barb, who's handling the slideshow, her and I, uh, three years ago, uh, in um, uh, 2014, last time I said 1914. <laughs> and the people were like, what? No, we went back and we visited, you know, all over the American battlefields, and, and we're going to talk a lot about the MERS Argonne uh, offensive. Which, by the way, I think you have that on the flyer. We we know the largest battle in American history. Ask some history professors, what's the largest battle in American history with the most men engaged and the most casualties? And they're going to go Gettysburg, uh, D-Day, Battle of the Bulge. No, it's the MERS Argonne. Uh, uh, September 26th to November 11th, 1918, is the largest battle in American history that our Doughboys, which was the nickname for the American soldiers, fought. And as you can see by the slide, of five and a half million unexploded ordnance still exists there. Mm -hmm. And every spring, like right about now, you know, the farmers here in Minnesota don't have this problem. The French farmers there too, they call it the iron harvest because they dig up stuff. But in fact, when we were there, there were a couple of American young guys uh, were in the neighborhood. We were we stayed in Mont Falcon, France, in the Lorraine region, and, and they asked like a French farmer, "Can we look on your uh, fields for some artifacts?" And the farmer said, "Well, I'm going to plow this field tomorrow. Come back tomorrow after I'm done." And, and the guy said, in about 15 minutes, they had 40 pounds of metal from World War One, and they kind of quit because that was enough. And uh, using, you know, regular estimates about what they fired and stuff, uh, French authorities think um, at least 25% of this ordinance is gas, unexploded gas shells. Um, uh, I, you know, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. If you dig up a shell there, you better just leave it alone. It, whether it's gas or whatever, it's danger. Because uh, uh, it's a couple thousand French and Belgian people have died since World War One has ended by just picking up shells or kicking something because you know they they're it's dangerous. It's live ordinance. All right, well we'll move on. All right, here's the uh, belligerents, the people who are fighting each other, which you know they're going to go and fight each other again in World War Two. But uh, the central powers of Germany, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, Turkey, which is the the end of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Bulgaria. You notice, like I put the Italians on both sides. Like, you know, the, people always laugh at the Italians. I don't know. Maybe they're smarter, because like in both World Wars, the Italians just kind of wait and hang out to see which side is winning, and you know, then they just change sides and get to the winning side. Because you know, later on, Italy joins 
the Allied side. And you know, we joined in April 6th officially, 1917. Do you know, show you how pacifist like Woodrow Wilson really was. He he always says that the United States is not really a, a full ally. Where he in fact he calls it he says we're associate ally, associated with Britain and France and you know Russia. Russia gets knocked out in 1917. The Germans actually knocked the Russians out of the war in World War One. But um, you know, would oh Tommy Wilson, you know he says Britain and France and whatever are fighting for territory, but when America gets in, we're fighting for uh, you know democracy and ideals, and so we're really associated. We're not after the same things they are. Next slide. I better go faster. Here's you know the the spark that lights the flame. On June 28th, you know if we've read anything, we know that uh, Archduke Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. There's the Archduke. He's got the funny hat, you know. And there's his wife Sophie uh, <coughs> of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Next slide. Um, they they get shot on that June 28th, 1914, which you know begins to start the war, though. That's not really saying how it you know really starts, but it's the spark. And you know a lot of uh, he, he's shot by this guy, our Garvillo um, Princep, this uh, Serbian, he's this 19-year-old Serbian college student. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, the BBC did this like World War One presentation, and they talked about how the war, World War One, started over a sandwich, right? Because you see, the princep was eating a sandwich at Schiller's Deli. Because you know, the Archduke and Sophie, um, uh, uh, Serbia um, had just gotten their independence from the Ottoman Empire, and um, they were trying to make a united Yugoslavia. And uh, the Austrians were worried about the Russians moving in, because the, the Serbians are Slavic people, and they relate to the Russians. And they, they were worried about the Turks doing something. So the Austro-Hungarians, they just invaded Serbia. They just came and occupied. And, our, and you know, the Serbians basically didn't really like that. Another empire trying to move in on their territory. And the Archduke Ferdinand went uh, with his wife Sophie to, uh, you know, visit military installations. By the way, you know, his, it's his uncle, Franz Joseph, is really the emperor of Austro-Hungarian. He had, like, two sons who died. And, and so, really, uh, Ferdinand is his nephew. But he's the next in line to the throne. I just throw that out. <laughs> and, and people told him, you know, people told Ferdinand not to go, go back. Um, um, but, you know, he, he goes, and, and there was this conspiracy. There was all these college students that wanted to kill him. So he, he's driving through Sarajevo, and they throw a bomb at the car, and, and it misses. But a bunch <clears throat> of people, I think a couple of people got killed and wounded, and, and Ferdinand drives to City Hall, and the mayor gets up in of Syria in front of the crowd. He starts giving the speech and thank you, Ferdinand, for coming and thank you, all you people, for being here. And, and Ferdinand says, what, what are you, an idiot? I just got bombed with my wife in this open car. People are dead? And you're, you're acting like nothing. He goes, I gotta go to the hospital and check on the victims. So he gets in the car and he starts driving and they're going the same route they were going. And somebody tells the driver, you're going the wrong way. So the guy stops the car at Schiller's Deli. And Princep, who's part of the conspiracy, but you know now, you know the bomb didn't work, so he thought, well, I'll just go have a sandwich. And he's outside, like eating his sandwich. The car stops right in front of him, and he thinks, what a gift! He pulls out his pistol, fires three shots, uh, kills the Archduke and Sophie, and and you know this is them getting Princep, which you know what they're going to do to him is not nice. But anyway, you know that you know starts the war. But it, there's all these things going on. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is a great poster, Chain of Events, which you can see a chain of friendship. Um, it was by a Brooklyn newspaper. If Austria attacks Serbia, Russia will fall on Austria, and Germany will fall on Russia, and France and England will fall on Germany, and it's all mixed up and confused. Uh, wars, you know, how do I say this? You know, wars probably could be avoided if people negotiated better. But if there's one war that really doesn't need to happen, and we saw, see millions are going to die, it's World War I. 
And after it starts, um, and, and, and countries are just like not ready. Germany's probably the most ready of all the countries to fight a huge war. But I mean, France and Britain and the rest of them are just like not ready for this. And there's really kind of no reason for it. But everybody's kind of angry at each other. Um, we should say a little bit about the, the 1870 Franco-Prussian War, where the Prussians or the Germans invade France. They take Paris, and they take the Alsace-Lorraine Alsace region of France, and now it's part of German territory. And the French are pretty angry about that. They want the Lorraine back, and so that's going to spark that. And actually, the only real reason, like, well, Britain gets into it with Germany is because Britain has a pact with Belgium, like we do today, like a NATO alliance, saying if anybody invades you, we'll stick up for you. Plus, the Germans are obsessed with uh, building a great fleet to challenge the great British fleet. And so the Germans keep building ships, and Britain's a little uptight about that. And there's all these little reasons. And America stays out of it for a while. Next slide. And here's the, uh, the, the Schifflin, Schifflin plan, which doesn't work. I have the, the map on here. The, plan. the Germans have been planning this since 1870. This wide sweep through Holland and Belgium this way and take Paris, you know, and take France and call it Germany and whatnot. So Schifflin, this uh, German general, has been planning this forever. He, he's actually dead. He dies in like 1913, but the Germans have been planning this for years. The French, uh, here's the Lorraine region right here, which is see part of Germany. The French have been itching to just get back in here. So actually, next slide. Uh, Holland declares neutrality. Is everybody following me? This is a lot to go on, but are you following me? Yeah, I don't, you know, I never know if people are following me. I just go. Uh, Holland um, declares neutrality. Right? So uh, once Holland says we're not going to get into the war, the, the Sheepland plan was to go. It, it was said that the, the right, the grenadier on the right flank for Germany should touch his shoulder on the ocean. Right? <coughs> the sweep on the sweep, right? And now Holland's out of the war, so the Germans have to change the whole plan. And, you know, they're going to go through Belgium because all this line in here, the, the French have built a series of forts. And whatever. So to avoid that, it's a right flank attack. Then the meanwhile, well, nobody talks too much about this, is when the Germans attack in 1914, and it's a mobile war. To be the first World War War I is not trenches, they're moving, really moving. The, the French attack this way into the Lorraine. So you know, one side's going this way, the other side's going that way. The Germans just do better and they get close to Paris. They get to the Marne River. Next slide. Uh, yeah, they get. They get to the Marne right outside Paris. And that's where Papa Joseph Jacques Césaire Joffrey, uh, the French general who was attacking into Lorraine, is able to shift troops to the Champagne or the Champagne region along the Marne. And he stops the Germans just sort of Paris in 1914. Otherwise, the Germans probably win a quick victory, which is what you know they're after. Everybody. Nobody expects to fight. Once they fight, they expect it to be over, like, you know, right away. And they, and they always seem, every war, they seem like, you know, they're going to fight, but nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody's going to get really hurt. The Germans are going to lose 300,000 men in 1914. Okay. 300,000 losses in the first year of the war. And plus, they're on the offensive, the, uh, the attack, so they're going to lose more men, generally. Speaking, if you're on the attack, you're going to lose more. So the French do not get the Lorraine region, and they have to shift uh, guys to stop the fight on the first Battle of the Marne. And we really get the stabilized front in 1914, and that's where we get into the trench war that we all know about from World War I. Uh, about 470 miles, almost 500 miles continuously through Europe of trenches, right? from uh, the uh, English Channel up in Belgium all the way to the Swiss border, right? And, you know, they always build the trenches in these zigzag patterns, right? Like this, like, like um, Crenelle's on a castle. If you looked at it from the ground, it'd be like this because you don't want to get flanked if you're in the trench, right? And we know the flank 
is the end of the line or the side, right? And, uh, you know, in warfare, you want to get on the enemy's flank or side or in their rear, right? And you get them on the side, right? The, our Navy always likes uh, to call it crossing the T. You can shoot up and down their line. You really got them in a, a bad situation. You enfilade fire or hit them in the flank. Well, you know, that's, that's pretty bad if you're standing out on the field and a guy can get you in the flank. But imagine if you're in a hole in the ground in a trench and the guy gets on the side of the trench and now, you know, they're going to have flamethrowers and hand grenades and tanks and, I mean, you're, you're in a hole in the ground and the guy gets you on the flank. You, you've had it. You can't get out of the hole. You're dead. So they build them in these, like, you know, blocks and, like, crenelles in a castle, right? so that you don't get flanked. Next slide. Uh, new technologies of the war. Wow, I'm already 25 minutes. I got to hustle. <laughs> <laughs> well, people have lunch dates and stuff. All right, so you know, we got rapid fire artillery. You know, the French 75 millimeter cannon. It's one of the first cannons in the, in the Civil War. You know, when you fire one of the cannons, it could go 10 feet backwards after you fire it, and then you got to aim the stupid thing again, right? But the French developed a 75 millimeter, right? It's recoilless. So it fires and it doesn't move. And that's like, really changes everything if you don't have to keep aiming the thing, right? So that, and, then, and it fires faster. And, you know, now is this the first time they have uh, airplanes. Does anybody know, like, how much, you know, the, the Fokker, the, the Fokker aircraft that the Red Baron flew, how much it weighed? Weighed 129 pounds, the plane. Imagine that. Those guys in those planes. I, I, you know, that's the romance of World War. The planes are like, you know, you imagine flying it, and they, they go, they go about 125, 110 miles an hour. That, that's as fast as they're. And you're up in a thing like that that weighs that little, and they're, oh, that's really wow, right? And you know, tanks which is going to be, they think of it as an infantry support weapon, but Patton's going to try all these new tactics with tanks that, that go like 50 feet and break down. <laughs> and they're like giant pillboxes. It was first time with tanks. Flamethrowers, right? Germans come out with the flamethrower, which is like, you know, nasty, right? You're getting hit with a bolt of fire. Um, wireless communications, but the first like Wi-Fi, sort of, but not really. <laughs> But, you know, communication, that's like a big deal in warfare or anything, right? I mean, you know, be, you know before this, uh, they, they have the railroads, but now they, they have, you know, better ways. And, of course, we have gas warfare, which everybody's interested in. Here's gas. Um, you know, here's, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> everybody talks about, excuse me, <clears throat> the Germans using gas first, but they really didn't. The French are really the first to use it. They... They stick like a, a tear gas, a mild tear gas on like um, rifle grenades. And they fire it and the, the Germans don't even notice it because it doesn't really work. But the Germans like find out, oh, somebody fired something weird. It smells funny, but it didn't bother them. And the Germans start to develop because the Germans, you know, in the 20th century are all good. We're really good at warfare things, right? So they start developing chemicals and gas, nasty stuff. And, you know, you know, one of the first problems the Germans have, April 22nd, um, uh, 1915, uh, they fired the first, like, gas. And, um, y you know, what the Germans didn't calculate on when they fired the first uh, chlorine gas, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't think about wind. So the Germans, like, fire this, like, chlorine gas, and then the wind blows it right back at them. <laughs> and then they go, oh, we got to figure out gas when we fire these, you know, wind directions. <laughs> Otherwise, there might be some problems. All right, next slide. Uh, this is an actual, you know, some of the photographs for World War I are really terrific. This is actual British men coming out of a trench under a gas attack, and one guy forgets his gas mask, and you see what's happening to him, right? No, and it's not farting. The gas is not farting. They don't fart with, never mind. <laughs> All right, next slide. All right, here's a little bit quickly about, you know, there's three major types. There's about 100,000 deaths due to gas. So it's not really as lethal. You don't want to get hit with it because your lungs will never be the same. It may not kill you, but you're never going to breathe right again. And this says a little bit of how it, uh, you know, 
how it smells. Um, fa uh, the phosgene is the most lethal and it smells like a moldy hay. And you, you notice a lot of the thing, you discharge this yellow liquid from your lungs the rest of your life. And uh, you know, a lot of, and it feels like drowning, uh, both that and the mustard. The yep, mustard's used the most. Um, but you can see both with the phosgene and the mustard, it, it takes a long time before you ever even notice it. That, you know, it could take 10 to 12 hours before it really starts affecting you. And then it's probably going to affect you the rest of your life. Next slide. Uh, I just put this quote about the nurses. Is a, you know, there's really the Red Cross really blossoms in World War I. And the nurses, what they do through the war. Get, gas cases are terrible. They cannot breathe lying down or sitting up. They struggle for breath, but nothing can be done. Their lungs are gone, literally burnt out. Some of eyes and faces entirely eaten away by gas. We would believe them by pouring uh, oil on them. They cannot be bandaged or touched. Gas cases are invariably beyond endurance, and they cannot help crying out. So there's nurses with their gas masks on helping a gas victim. Go ahead, next slide. Oh, I, I just love this story, so I threw it in. This Belgian lady. Um, saved this, um, uh, this uh, Patrick Fowler of the British Hussars. Four years, she hid him in her cabinet in Belgium because the, you know, the Germans take over Belgium and he's behind enemy lines. So he lives in her cabinet for four years and she feeds him. It's in the museum in Britain today. And the, by the way, the British gave her a military pension the rest of her life. Next slide. All right, uh, this is Verdun. I swear to God, I'm going to get to the Americans in the war. But <laughs> um, we got to talk about Verdun because it's maybe the greatest battle of World War I. Um, so we got the stalemate on the trenches, and either, both sides want to keep trying to flank the other side, and it's not working. Um, they, they gain inches at a time, that's it. And the Germans decide, you know, we've got to do something. And, and they, they plan this attack at Verdun in the Lorraine region of France. Um, uh, southwestern France, and the Germans amass uh, oh, a couple thousand, two thousand guns, four divisions in a four-mile area, um, well, over, uh, a couple hundred thousand men. And anyways, Verdun is a battle like no other, because Verdun is like meaningless. It has no strategic significance whatsoever for either side. There's nothing valuable to it. It's really a, a salient. In other words, the, the German line, and I, I'm just doing like the length of France, or the French line, it comes like this, and then it bulges out in the salient around Verdun. The French would have been better if they just had a more straight line. But they leave Verdun. It's an ancient city, you know, uh, and whatever. And they, it's a fortress city surrounded by 21 big forts. And actually, Papa Joffrey, has, he doesn't even really tell anyone in the French government He's shifted all the guns out of Verdun because it's meaningless and they're on other parts of the line. The place is not really well defended and the Germans decide to launch this attack February 12, 1916. And luckily for the French, this gigantic snowstorm, like a Minnesota snowstorm, hits this part of France. And for nine days, it snows and whatever. And during that time, the French realize, uh-oh, the Germans are up to something on our front. I guess a snowstorm saves France, really. And the French are able to shift more men quickly during the snowstorm to um, the Verdun sector. And I, I should say this, the Germans have three rail lines that come into Metz, which is a city near here, so that they can supply their armies. The French have one uh, road here, uh, La Voie Sacre, or the sa today it's called the Sacred Way. And if you go to visit Verdun, you got to drive on the Sacred Way. They have one road to feed, which is going to be, you know, uh, half a million men to get supplies there. And they say if you ever go on the Sacred Way during this battle, it's just constantly going with trucks and jeeps and mules and wagons. And, and somehow the French uh, never get this line cut because if they do, they've had it. They have no supplies. See, when, when you know... There's a military thing with army generals, right? They say amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. M modern generals know you, you can't fight a battle or any war if you don't supply the men, right? It's about logistics and supplies, right? I always like look at the post office, the logistics of what the post office must do. 
and, and in warfare, you, you've got to, you know, supply the guys, right? That's why, you know, America fights in like Iraq or Afghanistan. How are you going to feed those guys every day? Because if you don't feed your guys, they're not going to fight well. If you don't give them bullets, they can't do anything. And you're going to fly 6,000 miles constantly. How are you going to supply them? Logistics is everything in warfare. So the French, the sacred way. All right. Uh, for done lasts about 11 months. Uh, it's about a million men killed both sides. They, they, the, uh, this, this uh, a couple of miles here, that's all the Germans ever gained. The French if, if eventually hold the Germans off, and both sides decide to fight over Verdun, but it's kind of really meaningless. In a senseless war, a senseless battle, the killing is just outrageous, really. A million men are lost at Verdun or more. All right, uh, next slide. Here I am at Fort Dumont, which... Um, which was the biggest fort. It's famous here, you know, the, the turtle shell guns. You see the guns, and I'm on top of the fort. This really tremendous, you know, they could rotate this giant turret and fire. But actually, the, the Brandenburgers from Berlin, for the Germans, take the fort without firing a shot because the, the French are sleeping. And they're, they're having coffee and croissants. And <laughs> <laughs> the biggest fort of Verdun is taken without a shot, which they said couldn't be taken. Next slide. Here's just some shots. Next slide. Of, and oh, you know, this, this is around Fort Dumont, but everywhere you go around the Lorraine, here, you, this shows some of the shells. It's, it's a moonscape. It, they say it, the, the Germans bomb, I think, for a week before they actually attack at Verdun. Both sides like to do this now, it, to, to break the other's line. They plan a massive infantry advance, but before they do, they shell with the artillery, right? The Germans figure out how the Germans are. Uh, you know, in 1915, the Germans realize it's going to be a long war. A lot of the German trenches, when you go over there, are built with concrete. The Germans build whole cities under the ground. In fact, ne near Verdun to the east is a little town vo called Vauquois that uh, my wife and I went to. The, the French people there were so tired of getting shelled, they, they built their city underground. It's like Cannon Falls underground. And the Germans come. It was like a town of 5,000 people. And the Germans come, they see this, and they go, this is clever. And then the Germans turn it into like 50,000 guys built in concrete and whatever. So when these, they do these attacks, the enemy will shell and shell. You just go underground. The Germans lived in pretty much comfort, right? And, and then when the shelling stops, you go, okay, the enemy, the infantry is coming. You get up, you get in the trench, and you shoot them with the machine gun, and you wipe them out. That's how World War I really is. And by the way, like, in a front-line trench, a guy is never more the, in the front-line trench for more than three days. Everybody thinks they live in the, the trench in the front line, like, forever. You, they never spend more than maybe a week or ten days in the trenches altogether because you have a, a trench, then uh, communication trenches that'll go this way in your rear, then support trenches, and then more communication, and then a reserve trench. And you might be in that system maybe a week. Otherwise, you're in the rear. You, uh, no, no one could live a month at a time in a, in a World War I trench with the rats and the lice and the conditions and the mud. Forget it. So, so it's not maybe what we think. Uh, next slide. More moonscape. Oh, here are, uh, yeah. See, it is good to have the presentation with the pictures, huh? Uh, I don't know if you ever heard about the trench of bayonets. Have you ever heard of that in, by Verdun? Uh, two battalions, uh, two thirds of a regiment, um, close to a thousand guys. It was said during the shelling at Verdun, um, uh, two French battalions died by being buried beneath the ground from the dirt thrown up by the shells, they were buried alive. And the French, by the way, this George Rien, an American, made this memorial, it's called the Trench of Bayonets. If you go to Verdun, you gotta go to the Trench of Bayonets. Next slide. So and you go inside this concrete tunnel, and they have the graves of the soldiers, uh, uh, you know, who were buried alive. And some people say it's a legend, that it never really happened, that the guys were killed by artillery and French soldiers then buried them. But it's this legend of Verdun. Next slide. Yeah, see, and the guy said they went and checked on their buddies, and all they could see was bayonets sticking up, that they were buried alive. The trench of bayonets. You know, the, 
the, the French have to put barbed wire and electric fences because every time they put things up, people come and steal it. A lot of vandalism on the battlefields there, much more than here. Uh, uh, I, I, I love France. And the, the French people, all the times I've gone, have been not, they're nothing but nice to me. And my French is like non-existent. <laughs> I try. I do bonjour and s'il vous plaît and merci. But, um, but I have to say, like, you know, even though I love Paris, Fleury is my favorite French village. And it doesn't exist. During the Battle of Verdun, nine French villages were completely wiped off the map. But the French people keep those villages alive. They elect mayors. They have city councils, Liberians, but it doesn't exist. The other local villages, you know, run it. And you can go visit these villages. Fleury's famous outside Verdun, and they, they have these posts like, here was the library, here was the bank, here was the bakery. It, it's, it's just tragic when you go, it's gone. All right, next slide. Uh, the ossuary at Verdun, and you, you got to go see this if you go there. The ossuary has this like um, obelisk thing, which there's a, a long chapel in here. You remember when we went the first time there, and the, the guard told me to take off my hat because I didn't realize it, it's a, it's a chapel, and it's got these wings with these glass windows. Um, next slide. There's over a hundred the bones of 130,000 soldiers in the trenches. And you can go up to these windows and look down, right? Now the windows are kind of down here. And you look down and you see skulls and femurs and feet and arms and hands. And, and, and if you go to the ossuary of Verdun, if you go to Verdun, you got to go there. I, I, for, for me, I, cu I couldn't really do anything else the rest of the day after seeing something like that. They, it's just bones piled up to, to the top of the trench, 130,000. You know what's even sadder? Is, you know, we're looking at this, and I turned around. It's up on a hill on a ridge, and you look down. There's a little valley, and there's the graves of 25,000 French soldiers who were killed in the battle. So that's 25,000 buried, and then you have this. Next slide. Uh, then the Somme, another senseless battle. The Somme, more north towards the Belgian border. Um, um, you go to the Somme, you gotta. You got to stay in Albert, France. All right, nice little town. It's got this, the most incredible World War One museum there you would ever want to see. And most of the Somme battlefields are around Albert, near um, in the rear of the British line. Uh, the, the Somme was really the British and the French attack for 1916. They were going to launch this offensive and try to get the Germans, but the Germans beat them to them, beat them to the attack with the Battle of Verdun. So Verdun happens in February. This battle is raging. So the British and the French decide in July, on July 1st, to launch the Somme attack, Somme attack as a diversion from Verdun, try to pull some of those German troops out of Verdun and make them fight up north. Again, uh, uh, Joffrey plans the Somme. It's another area that has no strategic significance what if, what if you conquer this area, you know, whatever? Uh, what are you going to get out of it? Really nothing. Uh, by, by the way, the Germans gained like five miles at Verdun. I think the British gained six miles at the Somme. Again, there's about a million casualties for the Somme. The first day of the Somme, July 1st, 1916, is the worst day in British military history. You know, the Brits have been fighting more than we have. It's the worst day in British history. They lose 60,000 men in one day about 20,000 killed on the first day going over the top, gunned down by the German machine guns. Next slide. Yeah, here's some of the casualties uh, for the Somme. It's just, you know, devastating warfare. Next slide. Oh, okay, we're almost getting to America and the war. Uh, everybody's heard, well, if you know anything, you know about the sinking of the Lusitania, right? But you know, you can see the, the date here, May 7th, 1915. The Germans, you know, gunned down this cruise ship and 128 Americans are killed. But you know, we're not gonna get in the war for two years. So the Lusitania, the sinking of this, it doesn't start America in the war. Um, next slide. Um, 
And there's some of the other reasons. Like I said, Woodrow Wilson is trying to keep this peace. Peace without victory, he keeps saying on both sides. They don't, who wants, who's, when you're getting this many men killed, you're going to listen to the American president to stop? They, they don't even listen to him. They, they really don't. They just keep killing each other. Um, but uh, it really is this unrestricted submarine warfare. The, 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 the America has decided to supply the British and the French with munitions and supplies. So we got convoys of ships, merchant ships, going over there, guarded by the British Navy. And the Germans start torpedoing them. And they say unrestricted submarine warfare. They'll, they'll torpedo any ship going across the Atlantic. Um, and, one, and then they stop, because we start to complain. And the Germans stop for a couple of years. And, but the Germans complain about it because they say, we know you're shipping arms to the guys we're fighting against. So you're really in the war. Well, you, you understand that argument. And the Germans are really correct, because we are, right? Um, but Wilson, here's, here's one of the things Woodrow Wilson, a confirmed pacifist, does. Could you imagine this? He says to the Germans, if you fire a warning shot, we'll stop our ship. You can come aboard and, and inspect it. We'll let you inspect it as long as you let our guys go and the convoy go or the ship go after you don't find anything. You, you, you don't do that to American shipping. Get out of here. You can't get. I wouldn't let anybody on my ship if I was a ship captain and an American. And, you know, the Germans are like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But then again, you know, in 1917, the war is going on the way that the Germans say, you know, we're going to stop this. We're going to start torpedoing again. And then, you know, they start to sink some other ships and what have you. And so, go ahead, next slide. But here's the Zimmerman telegram. Anybody heard of the Zimmerman telegram? It's got to be the stupidest note in world history. Here's why this is stupid. The British have cut all telegraph lines or whatever. If you live in Europe and you want to send a message to, an Amer to America, you have to send it through London. All telegrams go through London, unless you have some secured email address. How's that sound? <laughs> For the email things we've had, <laughs> or you know, wiretapping, right? Well, so the Germans on an unrestricted email access or Wi-Fi or whatever, I'm making a joke, they didn't have that then. But they, they send this telegram to Mexico. Because you know, we've been fighting Pancho Villa. The Mexican bandit has invaded America, and there's this, the Mexicans have been coming into American territory, and Blackjack Pershing, our future commander, is chasing Pancho Villa in Mexico. The Germans send this message through London to the Mexicans and say, like, if you want to um, invade um, and get back your lost territory of uh, they actually say Texas, too. Texas, Kansas, New Mexico, and Arizona that you lost during the Mexican-American War in 1846 to 1848. We will support you. We'll make war together, right? Generous financial support, understanding the Germans allied with the Mexicans. And the British, I, I'd like to say they intercept this message, but it's not even an interception. Like somebody gets and goes, oh, look at this. The Germans are sending this thing to Mexico. I mean, is that easy? And so they give it to, and, you know, once we hear that, with the unrestricted submarine warfare, you know what public opinion is. We, we got to go fight these guys. That's enough, right? But, it, you know, I always think somebody should have told the Germans to read a history book because, like, you know, when was, like, Kansas part of Mexico? I mean, the Germans can't get anything right, right? I mean, really, come on. All right, now, there he is. There's Tommy, Thomas Woodrow Wilson. Uh, even Wilson, the confirmed pacifist, he, he can't. There's, he can't stay out of the war. He's won re-election with the campaign motto. He kept us out of the war, but now 1917, Zimmerman telegram, Lusitania sinking. He goes April 2nd before our Congress and says, you know, we must. He he, he still actually wants to stay out of the war. He knows, but he says we got to declare war. April 6th they vote. America goes to war. Here they are. Here's the Doughboys. The first division is going to land June 25th, 1917. Next slide. There's Papa Joffrey. The, the British and the French, you know, send delegations over as soon as we declare war to try to explain to us how to fight the war. Uh, by the way, Woodrow Wilson has one meeting with General Pershing, one meeting in May 1917. 
Pershing, I, 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 we should say this about Blackjack. In, in 1915, when he's fighting Pancho Villa in the, on the Mexican border, he, his main base is really the Presidio in San Francisco. That's, you know, and he has his family there. He's got three young little girls and one young son. And his, he's, uh, he just gets his hardwood floors lacquered and it catches fire. And, and his wife and his three daughters are killed from smoke inhalation. The little boy, he's like, I, don't call me. He's five or six years old. Francis Warren Pershing, he, he gets out somehow. And that's all that's left of his family. So Pershing has gone through this awful, I don't know how anybody faces that uh, tragedy. A at any rate, um, when they come over the delegations, the, the British say you have to amalgamate the American troops. This is going to be a constant through our involvement in the war. Uh, Douglas Haig, the British commander over there, he wants American troops to come over and fight in the British line. In fact, when you see us with the Dolby helmet and the uniform, those are British uniforms, carrying British uniforms, sometimes British weapons, always French weapons. Uh, America's totally unprepared to go in this war. We, we have no, we declare war, we have no way to get the guys over there. Wilson has done nothing to build, and then people will say how Wilson was such a great wartime president and how he does the buildup. He does the buildup after he declares war. We're not ready. We have to borrow uh, merchant ships and ocean liners and captured German ships just to get the guys over there. And the uniforms they wear are British uniforms, all right? But uh, Haig and the British say, you, best way to get the Americans going, it takes a, it takes a division. American division is about 28,000 men, about twice the size of European divisions, all right? Their infantry divisions. It takes a division six months to train and get ready and up to snuff to go into the trenches and fight. The British say, if you let them fight with us, they'll, they'll be up and running no time with our veterans. And, but Papa Joffrey realizes, uh, even, even though he's, actually he got promoted after Verdun, and, but he's really fired. Like if, you, if a guy's a national hero and you can't really get rid of him, you promote him and get him to shut up, right? That's what's happened to Joffrey. And he comes over, and Joffrey though, he, the, America, we have great parades. Everywhere he goes, he's this hero of war. Americans love him. And Joffrey says, he understands like the American psyche, and he says to Wilson and Pershing, Americans should fight as Americans. You're, you're a great country. Be Americans. And that's kind of the policy we're going to you know, follow. And, and uh, Wilson has this one meeting with Pershing. And, and it says that Pershing starts to ask him, like, I'm so sorry about your wife and kids. How's your son? And how have you been eating? How do you feel? And, after a while, Pershing goes, is, is there a reason you called me to the White House, Mr. President? And, and Wilson says, yes, I'm going to make you commander of all American forces in Europe. And he gives them two directives. Go over there, win the war, and come back. And he says, make Americans fight as Americans. That's it. That's all Pershing has. Can, just imagine if our president today said that to one of our generals in Iraq. Just go over there and win whatever you got to do. Pershing has this great leeway to do this stuff. There he is. Uh, a lot of people, you know, knock Pershing because he, he, has, he has the ideas that the Europeans have in 1914. Pershing thinks you can, with morale and spirit and the guy with his rifle and a bayonet, and he jumps out of the trench with that American courage, he'll just knock the hell out of the Hun and break his line and run through. And, the, you know, the British and the French are like, you know, we tried that. That's... <laughs> Not working, but Pershing attitude is American gusto, gun ho our boys can win the war. You're going too fast for me, but stay there. That's Haig, there he is, look at him with the beady eyes there. <laughs> Always wants us to send guys his way, but you know, doesn't think much of the Americans. What does he know? Uh, the American doughboy wins World War I, okay? We bail the British out. Go, go back, next, there is Pershing, and he, here's, here's uh, um, uh, General Foch, who becomes commander of all the Allied, he's the Eisenhower of World War I, the French uh, General uh, Ferdinand Foch, and Foch goes back to the British line, you must fight with the French and the British, amalgamate your men into our units, and this is Pershing's uh, over and over. Gentlemen, I've thought the program over very deliberately, and I will not be coerced. Americans will fight as Americans. But we should say a few units do support the British and the French. Um, 
there's, there's Foch. Have you ever been to Paris and you go to Napoleon's tomb? He's buried in a, in a, a fantastic tomb right above Napoleon. Second greatest commander the French have ever had. That's the way they look at him. No, he, he is a really, he, he is an Eisenhower. He's the right man for the moment. You have to say that about Foch. He's, he, he knows the, 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 the personalities and the feelings of the nations. And he brings this force together of British, French, and American and leads it on to victory. Here's the German guys, right? There's, there's uh, Hindenburg who, you know, he fights to the end of the war and, you know, later runs for chancellor right before. And there's, there's little Willie there, Kaiser Wilhelm, little Willie I call him. Him and his son Wilhelm II, the two little Willies. And, but here's the guy, Ludendorff, right? Erich von Ludendorff. And if you want to read about one guy that represents like Germany in World War I, you know, with the pickle helmet and the hobnail boots and the, the militaristic, you know, you know, German military guy, Ludendorff. This guy is unbelievable. After the war, he's unbelievable. In fact, you know, he, he resigns three days after the Merz Argonne offensive begins because Germany's lost. And he, he has to escape Germany because Germans want to kill him after the millions of men they lost. And he escapes with like a ridiculous disguise. I always like to say he wears those like um, 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 uh, Groucho Marx glasses, you know? Like the, the little must, no, but he, he wears these like bright blue sunglasses and he puts on a fake beard, like a cane, and he, and he, <laughs> he escapes out of Germany and he goes to Sweden, right? Because the Swedes will take you. And he lives there for a couple of months, <laughs> right? <laughs> And they kick him out of the country because his writings, he, 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 he gives, there's a lot to say that Hitler gets a lot of ideas from him because Ludendorff says the world's problems are caused by Christianity and Jews and Marxists and Bolsheviks. And after a while, the Swedes are like, you know, you, you can't stay in our country. <laughs> Get out. So then, you know, he, he comes back to Germany and he moves to Munich. He's in the beer hall push in 1923, you know, when, in Munich when the, Hitler comes in and fires the shots and German police are killed and he, he gets arrested and put on trial and it, his, his chauffeur gets a year in prison and he gets acquitted, which doesn't make any sense. But Ludendorff starts, uh, it's still around today, it's like the Society for the Knowledge of God. It's still around today in America and Germany because he believes in, in all kinds of deities and I don't know. He's, his writings are crazy, and he wrote a lot. And what? I, okay. Anyways, I gotta. <laughs> I only have four minutes left, but I'll keep going. Okay. Uh, here's. So uh, the other thing I, I love is like when America declares war, Kaiser Wilhelm standing there, and he has this admiral come up to him. Uh, I love this guy's name, Herren von Holzendorf. And Holzendorf says, I guarantee you, Kaiser, not a single American soldier will step foot on the continent of Europe. And then the Kaiser looks at Ludendorff, and Ludendorff says, um, he says, I don't give two hoots about America. They don't mean anything, right? Right? Yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to kick your butt and win the war, right? Um, and so, but having said all that, in March 1918, Ludendorff knows if America, he really knows the truth, if America gets in, we've lost. So he launches what's called the Five Offenses of 1918 to try to win the war. In, the, in these attacks, the Germans mass on a 60-mile front. They, they mass over 6,000 guns and 4.7 million men. America only gets 4.8 million men in uniform for the whole war. So Ludendorff's one last throw of the dice in these five attacks to break the trenches on the Western Front. And he can do this in 1918. Because at the end of 1917, Russia surrenders, or eventually gives up. You know, and they have the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, and, and by December, they've signed a, a surrender agreement. Um, I'll, all right, well, we'll go here. This is, a, you know, I had to go to the crash site of the Red Baron. I was talking about the flyers. Um, and, you know, Manfred von Richthofen with 80 confirmed kills. Some people say really over 100 was the great ace of World War I. And I, I, I mean, it is kind of romantic stuff flying. And nobody was as good as the Red Baron, right? So, uh, 
<laughs> my poor wife, I think Barb, thanks for doing that that day, by the way. Uh, we, we took like a whole day in the pouring rain to try to find the site. We, I had all kinds of maps figured out. It's, I still drove around the Somme River for like a whole day because I had, and I finally found the site. There I am in my raincoat from Grand Marais. And in the pouring rain, God, next slide. There's, there's the field where he went down. So, uh, you know, Roy Brown, the British fighter player who had nine kills, claimed he shot him down. But when they did an autopsy on his body, they found a machine gun bullet in his side. Next slide. Uh, leave it there. Um, so there was an Australian machine gun unit there, which now pretty much say the Australian guys got him with a machine gun in the air through the side. All right. Uh, this, uh, this is a map, um, which gives you all the battles where America is going to uh, fight at. Next slide. Here's some first things for the Americans, the first cannon shot. Um, uh, uh, this stuff, I like this, the night of November 2nd and November 3rd, the first three Americans killed, uh, Corporal Gresham, Private Enright, and Private Hay. And they're still buried over there today. Next slide. The Big Red One, which is Pershing's boy, the 1st Infantry Division. But you know what? The, the unit I really like is the 2nd Division, because that's my grandpa. They were, the 2nd Division's better than the 1st. <laughs> All right, here, uh, this is a really lousy map, the Battle of Cantagne. Again, my French is terrible. But uh, they want to give the Americans something to do. It's the first real American battle. So they tell the Americans, OK, there's this Cantagne, and there's this little hill here by the town that the Germans have fortified as this observation post, take it. And so the 1st Division is given the task with French tanks, 12 French tanks. And they, they attack. Not only do they break through the French trenches, they, they gain a mile more than what they're supposed to. And they want to keep going. And the French are like, no, don't, because the French are war weary. Stop. And so, but it's a big success for the 1st Division. And the Allies are happy. The Americans can fight. It's our first real. Here's the Indian head for the 2nd Division, which, by the way, the 2nd Division in World War I suffers more casualties, captures more guns, more German prisoners than any other unit. Even though I have to say, Pershing's baby is the first division, Big Red One. But the second division has, I think, a better combat. There's my grandpa, who fought for the 23rd Regiment, Company H of the second division. And we got to talk about Bella Wood, right? The great American fight at Bella Wood, or near Chateau Thierry. Um, the Germans, the, the, the first other offense is Michael and uh, Georgetta are to knock the British out. They attack in the north with gusto and try to knock the British out. They don't get very far. But the third attack, they start attacking towards the French. And they break through on the Paris Metz road. So the road to Paris is open. They finally broke through after four years. And they're coming through. And so the closest American units uh, are the second division, which is uh, the only American infantry division, army infantry division, that's had other units in it. Half of the second division is made up of Marines. US Marines, in fact, they're going to be commanded by two Marines, the division. And one of those Marines, I'm sure you've heard of, is John Lejeune, commands the Marines. Camp Lejeune today is named after him. And even today, the second division holds the Korean line. And half the division is made of South Korean troops that wear the second US Army patch, even though they're South Koreans. So it's always been a mixed special kind of division. Well, at any rate, um, we go back to the map. Um, the Germans break through. The Marines come in. And they, they're, they're first, it's hard for them to get to the front line because there's so many Frenchmen retreating through them. Famous line by Captain Lloyd Williams of the Marines of the 2nd Division. The Frenchmen say, you've got to retreat. You've got to retreat. And the, Marine, the captain of the Marines says, retreat? Hell, we just got here, right? <laughs> and the Marines you know, attack. And then they're told to take Bellow Wood. It's a battle that lasts uh, 25, 26 days. And the 23rd Division is over here, too. They attack this way. And um, they, they not only hold the line and, and, and stop the, uh, the French from crossing the, the, the bridges over the Marne there and, and the Asni River, uh, they hold the line. And it's a, it's a great victory. Um, but you know there's a lot of casualties. Next slide. Oh, oh you know. The Germans give the Marines the nickname they have today, the 5th and 6th Marine, right? They call them Tufelhunden, 
or uh, devil dogs. And today, you know, the, the fifth and sixth Marines can wear the devil dog patch and the French patch that the French gave them with the, the nickname because the, the Germans said, and it really confused the Germans because they weren't sure what a Marine was. And every time they captured a prisoner and they, they said, what army unit are you? And they go, I'm not in the army. And they go, yes, you are. And then, no, I'm not in the army. And then they go, I'm a Marine. And, you know, it screwed the Germans up. And there, you know, that's the bulldog, right, for the Marines. Uh, there's General Lejeune. Oh, and today, after the, the, the Marines took Bella Wood, if you go to the battlefield today, the French officially changed the name of Bella Wood to the Woods of the Marine. The Woods of the Marines, there you go. That's a French 75 that I talked about, which, you know, the Americans would have used a little howitzer. Keep going. All right, here's the third division, the Rock of the Marne, because the Germans are breaking through all over the Marne in this offensive of the spring of 1918. And we got to tell you, you've heard of this guy, right? The Ulysses Grant McAlexander. Oh, I thought I thought I put him in here for you guys. He's from Dundas, Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, he, and he's the reason he gets the Rock of the Marne. Next, all right. There's a it's, it's a bad map. This is a, go back to the map. Um, here's Moulin Ridge, not Moulin Rouge. It's Moulin Ridge, and there was this fortified position built on this hill. The 38th Regiment of the 3rd Division, now forever called the Rock of the Marne because of Ulysses Grant McAlexander, he holds the line. And for four miles all around him, the Germans break through. But the 38th falls back to just this position, this little valley around this little river, and they, they knock the hell out of the Germans. And they stop the advance and the attack, and they get the nickname the Rock of the Marne, which, you know, McAlexander, in fact, it's called... McAlexander's last stand. And, and the colonel from Dundas was in the fighting all the way. In fact, one of the captains comes up to him when they're, they're in the ridge here and he says, he says, Colonel, we, we got to leave. There's not going to be anyone left alive. And McDon, uh, McAlexander's comment is, well, as long as someone's alive, we're going to give them hell. Keep fighting. And he was, you know, and they held. All right. That, we went all through Chateau Thierry where the battle was fought. And it's a great little French village. And you're too fast with the trigger there. You got a hair trigger. <laughs> you can see the battle damage still all through all these French villages and, you know, on the, the church and whatever. By the way, right across the church is another one of those great French bakeries. <laughs> I, I like the French bakeries, as you can tell. All right, next slide. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's cemeteries everywhere all over France with the dead, American dead. And by the way, all these cemeteries um, with American dead of Marines and Army guys that fought at Belleau Wood and Chateau Thierry, the, the soil came from America. The, the French wrote back and they, they put dirt on boats and sent it over to France, so it is American soil. And the Frenchmen who take care of the cemeteries are paid with our tax dollars. And, you know, everybody knows the D-Day Cemetery at Omaha Beach, right? You go to these World War I cemeteries with American dead, you're going to be the only one there. It's, they're empty. And they're immaculate. They're, you could have a picnic there if you kind of wanted to. Or, I mean, they're beautiful. All right, next. Um, these, again, it's more dead from Bella Wood. You know, next. All right, uh, St. Miel. Um, I'm going. I'm already over. Is that okay? Yeah? Yeah. All right. The St. Miel Salient, which was, again, like the Verduns, and it's just below Verdun. It's another bulge or a salient. And finally, by this time in September 1918, we have the first American army. Not only have we enough troops and divisions, we've built the first American army. And the French and the British say it's time for the Americans to plan and execute their own attack with a whole army along a larger front rather than just a little battle of, like, Cantonet. And so... Pershing plants, 600,000 American troops in this attack, 1,500 planes, the most of any planes in any battle in World War I, 600 of which are manned by American pilots, um, uh, tanks, all kinds of stuff, and the Germans realize what's happening. So we have to say, just as we're ready to attack this line, the Germans start to retreat. Um, the French and the British think we'll get nowhere. In four days, we clear the salient. Uh, capture of thousands of German prisoners. It's a total success. But while, the, while this is going on, 
Ferdinand Folk, the, the, the Allied general, decides he's going to launch a massive attack, British, French, and Americans, all along the Western Front Line in an attempt you know, to win the war by 1919, the next year. And he says the Americans are going to be amalgamated and whatever. Next slide. Uh, well, here you go. A little bit about the, uh, the attack at St. Miel. Next, oh, we have Frank Luke. Well, you know, I'll get back to the attack, but we got to talk about Frank Luke because everybody's heard of Eddie Rickenbacker, right? Mm. Yeah, but to me, like the great American pilot of World War I is Frank Luke, and he, he's not going to survive the war. He's, he's 21 years old when he's killed. He's called the Arizona Balloon Buster. Except, should I tell him what you did? No. Yeah, you sure? So Barb says, when, when Barb goes back to work at her office there at this big bank, she says, I want to show my colleagues pictures and stuff. Can you send pictures of that Frank Luke, Luke guy? And I said, sure. So she puts it up there and, and you go to the next slide. Oh, OK. Well, wait. And so she, says, so she says, here's some pictures of Frank Luke's grave and stuff. He was called the Arizona ball buster. <laughs> I said, no, Barb, it's Balloon Buster. He got the dirigible. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Here, here's Frank. Look, three balloons in one day. And, and trust me, there's pilots, both French, British, and Americans, who will not attack a Zeppelin or a balloon because the Zeppelins were artillery observation posts and guarded by uh, anti-aircraft fire and planes, and guys wouldn't go near them. Frank Luke loved uh, knocking out balloons. And uh, 11 balloons in four days and three planes, right? Look at that, two in one day. We did this an astronomical record. Uh, Rickenbacker had 26 kills to lead all American aces. Luke had 21, and he didn't fight nearly as long as Rickenbacker. See, from September 12th to September 9th, 14 German balloons in four planes, 18 victories, right? 10 stories, 8 days, a feat unsurpassed by any pilot in World War I. And what, you know, the, uh, uh, Rick Tovin, and Rickenbacker copied them, too. They, they worked in teams. The flight guys, they'd go up in large squadrons, 18, 20 planes at a time. And you worked as a team. In fact, Rick Tovin, great killer, but he, he knew his business. And he knew Germany didn't have the pilots. And he told his guys, we get into a fight, and it's uneven. Get out. We're going to retreat and live to fight another day. And they had certain tactics and stuff. Frank Luke ignored all that. He was a lone wolf. He would just fly out of formation and go out it alone. So, a death wish, really. And they said that sometimes he'd go out on a mission with the squadron. He wouldn't show up for two or three days. And they thought, for sure, you know, he's dead. But then he'd show up, and they said, like, Frank Luke had a lot of French girlfriends. So he'd <laughs> knock out a couple planes and land in some little village and behind enemy lines, then come back and real daredevil. But he, he was asking for it. Next. And he's killed um, in, by, in this little French village of Marvats. Um, he, he had already knocked out two planes, but he had a whole bunch of German Fokkers on his um, tail. And, and he was already hit and wounded. And he goes by this village, which is well behind German lines. And uh, he just starts, he sees thousands of German soldiers marching through the town. So he starts machine gunning them while the other guys are hitting them in the back. And somehow he lands the plane in the local cemetery, and he's already bleeding to death, really. And he gets out, and thousands of German infantry start surrounding him. And Luke pulls out his pistol, and he gunfights them. And uh, then they, you know, they get him. Next slide. Here's the field by this little creek that they finally got him. Next, he wins the Medal of Honor. You know, and there he is, buried at the Meuse uh, Argonne Cemetery. Frank Luke, Luke Air Force Base in Arizona is named after him today. Who's ever heard of Frank Luke? He's great. All right. Hat in the ring, I, I love badges. That was Rickenbacker Squadron, part of the first uh, pursuit group. Here's the 42nd Rainbow Division. The old Reliables was the first, the second, 26th and 42nd Divisions. They were the first divisions that went over there, did a lot of the early fighting. Rainbow Division, go back. No, wrong way. You see, you see the symbol of the Rainbow Division is used for other things today, right? <laughs> But it was originally the 42nd Division of World War I. Next. Uh, there, Marshal Patan, Patan uh, uh, Pershing's getting into this fight with Folk, because Folk wants to amalgamate for this big offensive they're going to land. And it's Patan who recommends, famous Henri Patan, who's later going to get a 
sentenced to death because he collaborates with the Nazis in World War II. But he's the hero of Verdun. At this point, he's a hero. And he says to Pershing, uh, why don't you ta attack for the Mirzar gone sector as an American force on your own? And folks says, I'll go with that. All right. Worst terrain in World War I. The Doughboys referred to it as whalebacks, the hills, right? Germans had four years to de defend this territory from the Argonne Forest, about 20 to 25 miles, to the Meuse River, this little area. Nine divisions, 200, 250,000 men or less in, in this area. They're going to attack of these little rolling hills that the Germans have just fortified with uh, every kind of gun, plus the Argonne's on high ground. And the Meuse River is on high ground. The Germans have artillery that just can eradicate anything in its path. And Mount Falcone, uh, I'll just stay there. It's in the middle of the attack, uh, this big hill that the Germans really fortify. Foch says that the Americans can't take it till 1919. We take it in two days. Two days. The uh, 79th Division, the uh, Cross of Lorraine Division. And there's the American monument there. I, I think it's like, you know, I, I, some guy said 99 steps, but it's bigger than that. It's, pro, it's like 100 feet. I mean, it's just huge. Barb wouldn't go to the top, but I did. And I, I go to the top, and, and uh, there's an old French guy there, and he says, he says, an American, American. I'm like, yes, on salute, on salute. He starts hugging me, and he's like going, thank you, thank you. And I'm like, I, I, didn't, I wasn't around then. I didn't. <laughs> I got nothing to do with it. Uh, but I mean, the French people are like, and they're, it's, you know, they're little villages, it's a great area. Next slide. Oh, there's the famous ruins of the church there. The, uh, the Crown Prince Wilhelm II built an observation post there. That's where they sighted all the guns in the Verdun battle. And he, um, the Germans, we knocked it out so fast, he left all his sighting equipment and binoculars. It was a great prize. They built this secret observation post in there and the Americans some private and everything got a hold of his telescope and good prize for the war but uh, this this ancient church there the Vikings raided this church the Templars used to stay here on their way to the Holy Land the Crusades this is how old this village is in the church there I am in the church and there's you know all lined up with German bunkers you can see danger because the, the shells and Stuff are still all over the place. A machine gun us. There's bunkers. Germans really fortified Mount Falcon. There's another little bunker. Um, oh, the Lost Battalion. And you know, uh, if you have you go on the Smithsonian, you can see Shir Ami, one of the, the last carrier pigeon, who carried the note, the Lost Battalion, which was neither a battalion nor lost in the Argonne Forest. 554 guys attacked into the the Doughboys called it the Oregon Forest, by the way. Um, attacked in here and they got surrounded by the Germans for six days and held. At one point they called an artillery that shelled them and that was the last pigeon. He lost his leg, made it through and Major Whittlesley's note said, for God's sake, please, you're shelling us, stop. That was the note he had to his leg. Uh, there I, uh, we got to the Lost Battalion area and you got to go down this hill and it was raining and I mean the Argonne Force when they say it's a thick, it's probably the thickest forest I've ever seen. It really is. I mean, it's a jungle in there and steep hills. I, I couldn't believe it. And so the sign says it's down there, and it was starting to get dark. And so I started walking down the trail. I took a couple steps, walked back in the car, and I said, no, I'm not going to make it down there where they were. Here's another very new monument they put up just recently for the Lost Battalion. You see the pigeon. Oh, that's right. Go. We're really late. Um, that's machine gun Mike Ellis, who's heard of him. Captured 11 German machine gun nests single-handedly. Captured over 60 guys, given the Medal of Honor. Sergeant, uh, or really Major, Samuel Woodfill won the Medal of Honor, knocking out numerous machine gun posts and taking out Germans. Pershing called him the epitome of a doughboy. He, it was a great, he thought he was the great soldier of World War I from Indiana. There's Major Charles Whittlesley. Um, you know, who led the Lost Battalion. The, the Lost Battalion was a household word in, by 1920. Everybody in America knew who these guys were and Major Whittlesley. They were such great heroes. Whittlesley was a lawyer from New York, and he, he, never, really, he never really handled it well. 
uh, uh, there's, you know, Harry Truman was an artillery captain. We had to put Harry in. It kind of doesn't, it looks like him if you look close as a young man. All right, next. There's Barb in Paris eating a croissant. <laughs> and th those croissants are really good in Paris. All right, go ahead, next. Uh, and there's Sergeant York, captured 138 Germans. Single-handedly took out a bunch of machine gun nest metal. Can we all, you've got to see the movie with Gary Cooper, right? Sergeant York. All right, next, uh, keep going, that's the village. And here's what I say the real heroes of the AAF at the Mers Argonne uh, Cemetery. Next slide. There's Barb by her um, great uncle's grave, Carl Hiley from North Dakota, who fought with a Minnesota unit. You know, we got uh, our Dutch friends to get us a wreath to, to lay there by his, um, his grave. Um, there, there are 14,182 doughboys buried in that cemetery. It is the largest American cemetery outside of the United States in the world. Barb and I went there, you know, November 2014, um, and we, we stayed with some, a Dutch couple. Um, and, and we were the only four people in the cemetery when we laid the wreath. No one in Barb's family had been back there to visit Carl. Um, we were there at 5 o'clock, and they played uh, the national anthem, right, United States National Anthem. And it's an immaculate, beautiful cemetery. If you ever see what how, – how, how many people live in Cannon Falls? What's your population? 4,100. 4, it's over 14,000, so th you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and just immaculate. Is there another? There's a picture of Carl. All right. I think that's the last slide. No. Oh, yeah. I wanted to. Sh this is the last slide. The the Germans that are buried there, the French, because and you should go visit some of the German cemeteries. Not as well kept. The Ger the French said for the Germans to be buried in France, they wanted their graves never to see the light of day, and that they gravestones must be in black. All right. So you go to the German cemeteries. A lot of trees that block the shade, and there are these dark grayish looking tombstones. But you notice this, right? Because a lot of them were Jewish Germans, you know, and we know what's going to happen to the Jews of Germany afterwards. So, you know, I wanted to show you a picture of one of the Jewish soldiers that, you know, fought there, eh, maybe killed, you know, during uh, you know, 1917. So, and they really are dark cemeteries. All right, finally, you know, I think I'm done. I'm really, I've said, what's so long? Sorry. Questions? That's me. Yeah. yeah, I have two questions. One, sure. Where does that term doughboy originate? Mm. That, that is a great question. There's a lot of, you're going to read a lot of books about the doughboys and stuff that a historians say they definitely came from this. No one knows the truth. Okay? No one knows exactly where the term doughboy comes from. A lot of them, said uh, that um, they got them because of when they fought in Mexico and the dust would get over the uniforms and they looked like, it looked like flour or dough. Uh, other ones say the British gave it to us because the Americans had so much to eat and the supplies that came with the Americans. Um, and, and there's a story like some American units have to fight with the British. And the Americans were living it up and finally uh, on the, near the Somme sector, and then the doughboys started getting British rations. And they were like, you know what? And after like a couple of weeks of this, somebody asked what the hell's going on. They said, well, your rations aren't coming through anymore. This, you have to eat the British. And then they, they got in the rear and they found in the officer's mess, they had take, they were stealing the American rations. <laughs> so that, you know, they were, you know, they had a lot of dough. So no one really knows where that, that's a great question. You could write a book on that. Uh, no, I was a battlefield guy, and I did teach history. Now all I do is write, even though I have to admit I'm not really writing much. <laughs> and I go around and speak whenever I want to. That's all I'm doing, but no. Fantastic knowledge. I don't know how you remember all of that. Well, that's because I love it so much. It's easy for me. In fact, I, I feel bad because I've given you 2% of what I know. I mean, I'm sure when I get in the car, I go, oh, I forgot to tell them about this, you know? Keon. Um, we're looking at this uh, gravestone. What about the unknown tombs? Oh, the, unknown, the tomb of the unknown soldier, you know, in Arlington is a World War I soldier. That was the first one laid. And subsequent American wars, we've, we've added 
more tombs of the unknown. Um, but um, one of the one of the great stories, I mean, it's so sad. You know, some of the pallbearers for the tomb of the unknown were Machine Gun Mike Ellis was asked, the Medal of Honor winners, uh, Sergeant or Major Woodfill. The the uh, Samuel Woodfell, he, he signed up as a private. He fought in the Spanish-American War in the Philippines. He was in the Cuba. So he, he was a lifetime military guy. And then when the war started, they needed experienced guys. They made him an officer, which he didn't really want to do. He was a lieutenant. He got battlefield promotions all the way up to major. And when the war was over, he asked the Army, can I go, just go back to being a sergeant again? <laughs> so he retired as an enlisted guy. He was one of the pallbearers. But this story... You know, fascinates me. We saw Charles Whittlesley, right, from the Lost Battalion. Charles Whittlesley went back to New York and lawyered, and he, he would do pro bono for the vets, you know, and stuff. And But he, he was having a hard time dealing with things. He gets asked to be a pallbearer. And, and before he leaves, and they, they have it on uh, Armistice Day or, you know, Veterans Day, November 11th, when they, they lay the tomb. He, he writes out his will, and he wills everything to his mom. And he... And he and he goes and he uh, carries the, 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 the grave, the casket, and he does his business. And he goes back to New York, and he, and he buys a ticket on the, the Tulolo from New York City to Havana, Cuba. And he's on this, like, ship. It's a fruit company <coughs> ship, and he's going to Cuba. And uh, he says goodbye to everyone one night at 11.15 uh, at night, November 26th, and he's never seen again. And they go back in his room, and they find all these letters to family and friends that he's written. So Whittlesley, you know, was a pallbearer. He, he planned this. He, he was a pallbearer, and then, he, you know, he, he jumped ship, committed suicide. He couldn't handle it. So that's sad. He was a, he was in a household word. What else? Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> Actually, the Armistice State just meant session of hostilities. How long did American troops stay in Europe, mainly France or Germany? At the, at the oh, yeah, that's a good question, too. Um, my grandpa, uh, guys that had done well and stuff were allowed to leave, or guys who were Medal of Honors were like, and Silver Star winners got to go right away. Decorated guys, wounded guys got to go home in like December, a lot of them of 1918. My grandpa stayed to, let's see, the, I think the last ones were like February 1919, and he was, he was around Cologne, Germany. Uh, second Division, the First Division, a couple divisions went in occupied Germany. Um, and they said the duty wasn't too bad. Um, but uh, and my grandpa signed up for the draft. He, he came home in February, but he really didn't get out till like August. 1919, he sailed back to Texas. You, you know, I didn't know any of this. And the, the guy, he, my, my grandpa was like an Alvin York. He was from Kentucky, right? Always had his rifle, always hunting and fishing, lived out in the country, never said a word. My grandma would tell me things. When he would be there, he, he, he'd walk away. He, he just wouldn't, and I didn't know all this stuff about him. And, um, um, and I have more to even say about that, but it's hard to find any records about him. In 1973, we had the fire in St. Louis in the National Archives, right? And 80% of the U.S. Army records were destroyed. All my grandpa's records, I got a draft card, and I got the last few months. He, he got out, he, he, his back pay when he left for February to Texas, he was paid $4,700. In 1919, I imagine you could have got a house with that, and you know what I mean. That's a lot of dough. Um, but uh, all the records are short. Of course, the Marine records they have. So they stayed until the summer of 1919. That, that so they they you know they 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 stayed till I think August of 1919. The guys went back in in waves and whatnot. So yeah, and they occupied Germany. Yes, sir, you had a question. <coughs> I've got two questions. I can remember them both. Okay. Number one, <clears throat> do you think that there was a precedent set for <clears throat> the United States government to surveil and arrest war protesters during the First World War by 
the precedent set by Abraham Lincoln when he suspended the writ of habeas corpus starting in Yes, I do. One. Yes, I do. But, but Wilson saw, Wilson or someone mm -hmm. within the Wilson administration saw, well, this is what Lincoln did when he was really desperate in a situation. We, yeah, I kind of broke the law, but he did what you had to do. Let's do what he did. Was there, do you think they consciously look back to Lincoln? Well, so, you're, you're trying to defend <clears throat> Wilson, right? Not necessarily. I just want to understand. No, I agree. No, I think you're right. I guess I think Wilson. We look back with 20 right. hindsight. Right. But when you're actually there, right. suffering, worried, you're worrying about whether you're going to survive the day, just like 9 11, <coughs> the world looks different. And people, do, people aren't stupid. They do things that might look stupid, but we aren't there. And I'm wondering what's going through their mind at that time. Well, I. <coughs> excuse me. I agree with you, and I yes, I do think he used Lincoln as a precedent. But being not a fan of Woodrow Wilson, I would also say from his writings, even his attorney general, what's his name, Gregory, Wright Stillman says, you know, a lot of the people we're arresting are harmless. Doesn't I don't think that they can uh, use, I'm paraphrasing, injure our national security or what have you. Uh, they, they may foment other people that could be dangerous with their views, but we're arresting and convicting a lot of people that are harmless. And Wilson turns around and says, uh, fine, arrest more of them. I don't, I don't care. We can't have this dissension. But yes, Lincoln does have a precedent because, you know, you know the, the leaders of Maryland in, um, in uh, 1861 in the American Civil War are going to meet at the bank in Frederick and they're going to vote whether to secede and join the Confederacy or whatnot. And as they assemble, Lincoln sends in national troops and arrests them and violates habeas corpus. He never charges them. And a lot of those guys spend years in jail uh, just because they were about to vote. Lincoln didn't want to know the outcome for Maryland. That's certainly not in our Constitution. You know, but uh, yes, Wilson, you had a second question. I think it definitely does. Second question. Um, My understanding um, from things that I've read in the First World War is that one of the reasons why <clears throat> the uh, American generalship did not want to amalgamate into the French and British forces is because uh, Pershing and others believe that once they did, not only to lose their identity, but then they're going to be in the trenches being shot down, doing the same unsuccess unsuccessful things that had, been, that had failed the last four years. They wanted instead to get to the front and have more mobile, action-packed attacks where you can break the German lines, even though you might lose more men initially. You're not going to get anywhere being in the trenches. And I'm wondering, this seemed to have worked at at Chateau Terry and Bellow Wood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what was different about the American uh, attacks at these ver in these various salients that it worked, even with heavy losses, 116,000 men, they're only in the war about six months at most, uh, right. realistically. <clears throat> How is it they did that, whereas the British and French, who aren't stupid and aren't do not lack bravery, just got shot down. I mean, my friend came about the trench, get shot, fall back in for four years. How did the Americans do that? Did they have more tank support? Airplane support, or the Germans just, uh, they weren't entrenched as well because they had retreated or something? I'm not quite well, sure. Well, first off, the Germans are more entrenched when we're there, especially in the Mers Argonne region. The Germans, the, the Americans would refer to them as the 40s. Because they, they said the guys were in their 40s. They were the older Germans, and they'd been fighting four years, and they were living quite well. There's pictures of, like, German newsstands in the trenches and coffee shops. And, and, but because they had been there four years, they had really fortified their positions. So it's worse. Um, and this is what you're talking about. It's also the knock today on Pershing and the American generalship. And, uh, because if you read about 1914, with the British and the French and the Germans. The, 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 like uh, the Joffrey is an advocate of the bayonet, and, and, and so is Foch, and that you know French will. And after we lost in the Franco-Persian War, now we're going to come back with more willpower and whatever, and we'll overrun those Germans and the spirit of the war. By 1916, 
the average British and French and German soldier in the trenches, like, this is never going to end. And I'm never going to make it home, probably. And their, their fighting spirit is gone. And rightly so. I mean, you come over the trench, everybody's dead, right, by machine gun fire. The American attitude is a lot like the British and the French in 1914. It's the same thing. Persian believes in the bayonet attack. The infantryman with the bayonet and his rifle, he's going to win the war. And what can stop American, you know, courage? A lot of the reason, rather than tank support or air support, is the American soldier, the American attitude of independence and gusto and go get them. And we have that. Nobody else left in World War I has that. They've seen years and years of war. They're sick of it. It's a stalemate. It's never going to end. A Pershing doesn't want to go into the British or French lines because he doesn't want the American guy to lose his fighting spirit. But the Germans still have machine guns no matter how much. Yeah, but we overrun them. One of, one of the things we do is, like I said, American divisions are twice the size of the Europeans. And American generals believe more firepower, more men concentrated at the point of the attack will be able to break through, and our guys are just better. And uh, basically, we, we, we take the same kind of casualties the French take it for done. There's just many of us, and there is a gun all spirit, and we overrun the Germans. There's no, I, I don't, the Americans have no great tactical advantage than anybody else, except there's a bunch of us, and that great, I like to think the great American spirit, right? The, the great American fighting men. We, we always go over and bail the Europeans out. We do it in World War II, right? There's no great advantage. The tanks we use are French tanks. The planes we use are French planes, British planes. It, it is an American, the attitude of let's go over there and win the war. Does, yes, sir. Domestically in the United States, yeah. in World War in World War One, there was a lot of anti-German feeling. Of yeah. Fan, actually, a lot of pro-German feeling too, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, particularly in Baltimore. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what? That seemed to be the worst. In World War II, other than the Japanese, German Americans, Italian Americans, fared fairly well. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, though, being jived by my classmates at school, you're German. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. We'll get you. But uh, Roosevelt seemed to take a different tack than Wilson. He well, said, he said. I, I think, I don't know where I got this quote, but he said, we are going to win the war because our Germans are better than their Germans. <laughs> and in the, during, and I know that my father had said, uh, his growing up times, living in the area south of Rockford, Illinois, there was a lot of anti-German feeling. You actually had to change the name of towns. Yeah. German Valley became Cherry Valley. Other, other ones, they had to change it because it was just very, very bad. Right. Uh, was that, with, was that widespread in the United States in 1917? A very virulent anti-German feeling in, against Germans who were actually here as citizens. Yeah, well, yeah, there is. Frank, Frank Luke is German. And some people believe the way he acts, the way he does is because he wants to prove that he's American, even though he's German. You, you, you know what I mean? And, the, and his, maybe his own friend, uh, Joe, Werner is, I cannot pronounce his name right, but is like German too, and he'll break off and be a lone wolf with Frank Luke. So there is a lot of, the, the largest immigrant uh, nationality in America is the Irish. The Germans are close second in 1914. Now the Irish were more. Uh, I, I think, okay. Well, they agreed to disagree. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment, but there's a lot of there's a lot of anti-war sentiment, which is why Wilson does what he does with civil liberties. But you know, a lot of the Germans that are here fight in the armies, you know, like they do in World War II. Well, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Germans left America in the 1930s because Hitler called them back and fought in German units. So you have the same kind of thing, World War One. Although I don't know. Of any guys fighting for the Germans in World War One that, you know, left America to fight for the Kaiser. Oh, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it.